Hi, uh, welcome to this uh, NPTEL MOOC course on uh, maintenance and repair of concrete structures. Uh, today is the fourth lecture and we will be focusing on corrosion of embedded metals. And uh, this is the outline of this module on corrosion of embedded metal. We already covered uh, in the previous lectures, we already covered the significance of corrosion and fundamentals of corrosion, carbonation induced corrosion mechanisms and chloride induced corrosion mechanisms and last lecture we talked about uh, how bare steel rebars, uh, you know, what are the challenges associated with uh, the quality of the bare steel rebars and what to be ensured and then today we will talk about the coated steel rebars, uh, mainly the metallic coating and the non-metallic uh, coating and also the non-metallic rebars, uh, that also we will have a very uh, brief session on that uh, today. And so this is a, a recap on your seen this slide already. So essentially what we will cover today is this uh, uh, type 7, 8, 9 and 10 on galvanized steel rebar, fusion bonded epoxy coated rebar, cement polymer composite coated rebar and fiber reinforced polymer uh, rebars. So first uh, let's talk about the uh, galvanized steel rebars or hot dipped galvanized uh, steel reinforcement. Let's see how uh, these are the two specifications which are available uh, for you know selecting or you know, uh, you know qualifying the type of uh, this type of rebars, ASTM A767 and IS standard 12564. Now, how is this uh, uh, galvanization being done? So, first uh, objective will uh, you know first process is to clean the rebars because we are from the steel mill you know when it reaches this um, uh, galvanization unit you know they might have some dirt soil uh, or oil uh, anything which is on the steel rebar it has to be clean for that any coating which when we do it first thing to uh, you know do is to make sure that the surface of the metal surface is very uh, well prepared or cleaned so that is done in this process here up to here and then it is dried and after which the steel bar is uh, immersed into a zinc bath which is at 450 degrees celsius approximately and then uh, that uh, you know uh, the zinc uh, is adhered to the steel surface and then you are allowing it for cooling and further inspection before the uh, steel is sent out of the factory. Now what is there in this uh, zinc coating? There are essentially uh, you know typically there will be four layers uh, of the zinc which is formed you can see here this is the steel uh, the bare steel here and then you yeah this is the uh, uh, steel the uh, st bare steel uh, steel and then you have this very thin layer of uh, gamma phase here and then another layer here and then uh, you can see another border somewhere about here and then this is the pure zinc region. So the essentially there are about four regions which you can see in this and the, when uh, it is uh, because of this and the, uh, the steel gets protected and main thing to note here is you the, even the outer layer you have about 70 dpn hardness which is much better than the non-metallic uh, coatings, typical non-metallic coatings and uh, because of this high hardness you can easily handle you know the, the steel need not to be handled in a very delicate manner you can handle as we do in a normal construction site rough handling doesn't really create much problem for this type of steel and uh, this is one example just to show you how that you know the zinc will uh, corrode and you can really have significant thickness loss um, and this uh, particular um, corrosion of zinc helps the steel from further corrosion or in other words uh, galvanic protection is enabled uh, because of this uh, zinc coating and you can see here the the steel surface here this is not at all uh, getting corroded but only the zinc the thickness loss is happening only for the uh, zinc coating and one uh, major advantage of this type of uh, steel uh, or coated rebar is that uh, the uh, the coating itself is very uniform or uh, uh, you know at all the surfaces on the steel because steel rebars usually will have a lot of ridges you know it will have the rebar i mean the ribs as you can see here on this bath all this 
you know there are a lot of uh, uneven surfaces on the uh, steel uh, uh, uneven surfaces and um, this zinc coating is actually providing a uniformly thick coating as you see here it's very uniform over here uh, even and on this also you can see it is very uniform throughout this region so you get a really nice uniformly uh, thick uh, coating on the uh, steel surface which is a very good advantage and let's say during the rough handling uh, or even bending of the steel rebars uh, it gets damaged let's say the coating gets damaged or gets peeled off at some locations like this one here you can see it's the steel gets exposed so this is the steel here steel and this is the coating so here you have a little damage and the steel gets exposed in that region however because this coating is uh, directly in contact with the uh, steel, it helps in protecting it in a ga using galvanic action. In other words, you have galvanic protection is very well provided even if there is a little damage on the steel surface, which is huge advantage, especially when we talk about the rough handling uh, in our construction sites. So, uh, and even for bending, it's, it's very good. Now, uh, it, is, it has been reported that when the steel, uh, the galvanized coated steel is immersed in concrete or is embedded in concrete, uh, and, uh, because of the uh, very high pH of the fresh concrete, this calcium hydroxy zincate is formed in the very beginning. In other words, when the pH of the concrete is uh, greater than 13, some people say 13.1, 13.3. Anyway, let's take for this class, we'll say when the pH is greater than 13, there is a possibility of this calcium hydroxy syngate, which is formed on the zinc surface. And following which, there will be a reaction of hydrogen evolution. And this hydrogen evolution, the hydrogen which is released from the reaction, it will uh, kind of lead to a debonding of the concrete from the zinc surface so this possible bond loss is uh, uh, it is possible and however this used to be like you know a, a concern in the past and people have actually tried different technology and then and now today we have technology available which will uh, you know uh, prevent this bond loss uh, before we go to that bond loss thing one more thing i wanted to mention and there is a wide ph passivation range uh, you can see here the corrosion rate is very low when the pH is in this range. Okay, when the concrete gets hardened in the long run, even if the uh, pH is about 8, you still have very uh, uh, low corrosion rate. That's a very good advantage when you talk about carbonation induced corrosion and things like that. Well, okay, so we're coming back to this uh, how. Uh, people overcome this uh, issue associated with the hydrogen evolution and bond loss. The addition of chromates was tried and then it has been uh, found that when you add chromates to this uh, zinc coating, the bond loss is actually not really there. You can see here when there is no chromate, you see the bond strength is about 4 to 5 and when you add chromate at different concentrations, you get bond loss, uh, sorry, uh, bond strength is about uh, 7. So we can uh, say that you know if you have the zinc coating with chromate, you don't need to really need to worry about the uh, bond strength loss. And this is also another advantage is uh, this zinc corrosion does not lead to cracking of the concrete. For example, uh, if you are talking about an uncoated steel rebar, when there is a slight corrosion, uh, that can lead to cracking of the concrete cover. Uh, you know, and that slight I mentioned, it can be even in very small, uh, you know, less than one mil, and that can even lead to uh, cracking of the concrete cover. Uh, of course, it depends on the tensile strength of the concrete cover, but still, in most cases, it can lead to significant cracking, which is not uh, happening in case of zinc corrosion products because zinc corrosion products are loose and they're powdery in nature and then less voluminous it doesn't exert any expansive stresses onto the uh, concrete and if depending on the porosity of the concrete it can actually you know ooze into the uh, uh, pores of the concrete near the steel surface or near the zinc surface 
So that's a very good uh, feature uh, or you know advantage of this uh, uh, zinc coated or galvanized steel uh, rebar because the cracking of concrete cover uh, it can be also delayed or minimized. Other thing which is uh, very uh, important about this type of rebars is the uh, corrosion parameters or you know parameters which are very crucial for uh, determining the service life of the uh, HDG steel rebars, uh, systems with HDG steel rebars. So first parameter we will talk about is chloride threshold and which is about two to four times more than that of the uncoated steel. Chloride threshold is the amount of chloride which we already discussed in the previous lecture, uh, amount of chloride which is required to initiate corrosion. Okay, and that amount is about two to four times more than that is required for an uncoated steel. That means you need more time to initiate corrosion or service life can be uh, enhanced. And also uh, zinc has much wider passivation range. When you're talking about carbonation induced corrosion, this plays a major role because let's say you have, uh, you know, uh, very severe carbonation environment or, you know, the environmental conditions are very, uh, you know, uh, very severe or in other words, humidity range is very, uh, you know, ideal for carbonation to occur. And then in such case, uh, you will see that the pH of the concrete reduces, pH of the concrete reduces from around 12.5 uh, or something. If it is less than 9, then you will have a carbonation issue, which is here. But in case of uh, uh, zinc, uh, coating it can even go further down or you have much at even at a lower pH than 9 the rate is not that significantly high uh, unlike what is the case with the uncoated steel and moreover one more thing is the corrosion rate in our service life discussion we discussed that you know there is an initiation phase and then there is a, a propagation phase even for the propagation phase, even if, that means even if the zinc has started corroding, the rate of corrosion is going to be much less as compared to the uncoated steel. So all these will lead to a, a longer service life. So there's definitely an advantage of uh, going for uh, zinc coated or galvanized steel rebars. And uh, people have used it in many structures. This is a temple structure, a temple in uh, uh, South Chennai. And this is a bridge abroad where, uh, but only thing is the cost, you know, it's usually cost about, cost is much more, a little bit more, two to three times more than that of the um, uncoated steel. But I think depending on the type of structure you're building, the importance of the structure, and if you want to really look for the life cycle cost, uh, not the immediate or the capital investment, if you're really looking at life cycle cost, this might find you might find that uh, use of this kind of coated steel is uh, really uh, beneficial. Now let's look at fusion bonded epoxy coated uh, steel uh, rebars. Um, this is also widely used. See as a technology, what is the protection mechanism? This fusion bonded or this epoxy coating, it eliminates the direct physical contact from the, uh, between the steel and concrete. And because of that, barrier you know the, there is a reduction in the uh, you know potential or the drive for the corrosion and this uh, essentially it's a mechanical uh, physical barrier which is present between the steel and the concrete and that also reduces the uh, availability of oxygen which is necessary for corrosion reaction to happen you can see here the scheme and the picture this is the gray part is the steel darker gray and then you have this green coating and then you have uh, concrete uh, as the outer surface. Now, how is this manufactured? First, you take the steel rebar and then clean it as you show, as is uh, seen in the uh, top left picture one. First, you take the steel and then it is uh, sandblasted or, uh, you know, grit blasted and then cleaned and then it is heated to uh, about 200 plus degrees Celsius and then uh, it is passed through a chamber which is um, which is having a mist of this epoxy powder, uh, epoxy resin powder, and uh, it is uh, attracted to the steel surface by electrostatic forces. And then you have uh, quenching, you quench the steel 
uh, why quenching is required uh, because you don't want this uh, epoxy to be on the steel surface for long period which will probably lead to flowing of this uh, uh, epoxy onto the I mean uh, flowing downward uh, which might lead to non uniformly uh, thick coating also so to ensure that it is uh, uniformly thick we, uh, uh, the water quenching is very uh, uh, is the best way to do and then of course before sending it out you have to inspect for holidays or any damage is present but what we are seeing most time is when it comes out of the factory it is probably very good but as because of the poor handling at site uh, it's sometimes not really uh, wise to use this well let's see how it shows this is a picture a micrograph uh, collected from one of the steel rebar which was collected from the site you can see that all these black spots which you see they are all holidays or pinholes which you can say all these a lot of pinholes are present on the steel surface so these all will lead to uh, early corrosion and there are ways to check the uh, you know whether how many of these pinholes are present uh, on the steel surface. I mean there are a lot of pinholes you can see on this steel surface. This is a rebar surface which you are looking at. So there are uh, two major uh, type of equipment. One is using a wet sponge and other one is using a wire brush. Basically you keep this wet sponge or the wire brush on the steel surface and connect make an electrical circuit and if there is a holiday then electrons will pass through that and then circuit gets completed and if the if the coating is very good uh, very good insulator then you will not have the uh, closed electrical circuit and then with that way we can actually uh, determine whether the quality of the uh, coating is good or bad and just uh, this you can read later this is ASTM A775 very uh, latest code and this um, it show this table shows how this code was modified over a period of time what are the changes which were made uh, made major changes which were made in this coating specifications and um, you can see that you know there are a lot of changes as time passes people learned that something which is already in the specification is not good so they modified it so this is a nice summary of uh, these changes made in this code now let's compare this ASTM 775 latest version which was published in 2017 and the other IS uh, 13620 2004 uh, specifications. So you can see here the time to the first row it shows the time to coating ap application after the cleaning in ASTM it allows only three hours whereas in the IS it allows eight hours. So this might also be a problem because if you have five additional hours between this coating and the cleaning process then uh, it is the possibility of other materials getting deposited on the steel surface is high. So this is something which we need to think about. We may have to really reduce this uh, also. Then coating thickness. The uh, uniformity uh, is one thing and the thickness. How much is the thickness uh, average uh, you know, allowable? In case of ASTM you see 177 to about 300 microns whereas in the case of IS you see about 100 to 300 so this is wider on the why this 100 it is 177 in AS so you have about you know even the thinner coating is allowed in IS 13620 which is probably again not a good idea because we have experimental evidence that when the coating is less the tendency for the, uh, the th coating to be cracked is high which will lead to early corrosion so we may have to make it more and more stringent even continuity number of the holidays allowed in uh, ASTM is uh, less than three in IS we allow up to six and uh, uh, addition you know uh, no visible cracks or debonding after 180 degrees whereas IS allow, uh, say only up to 120 in case of our uh, earthquake resistant structures where if we are using these type of rebars the stirrups are bent to about 135 degrees you know th this is the angle by which we bend the st uh, stirrups and but uh, so at 135 uh, definitely this angle should be more than 135 to be able to uh, you know uh, consider as a test for uh, steel rebars which are going to be used for earthquake resistant uh, designs 
and allowable damage level you know uh, on the coating in ASTM it says less than 1% we say up to 2% 2 per, 2 is okay or 40 millimeter square is okay so these are all you know loose uh, you know I, I believe that these specifications should be much more stringent and uh, that will probably uh, help us in uh, ensuring that the uh, structures are going to be durable so these need to be relooked it's very important and uh, let's see what really happens in the practice you know so this is also if you see a coating uh, you know uh, damaged at the site especially at the ends we uh, generally apply uh, additional coating so this when you do this process this uh, in the red box when you apply additional coating it is actually done at the site which definitely does not uh, you know uh, it is not really done by fusion bonding it, because at site there is no high you know elevated temperature ambient temperature you are doing it so definitely fusion bonding uh, will not happen and uh, uh, when you uh, bend these rebars after epoxy coating the type of tool which are used is like this the liver uh, arm which you are using is made out of steel and you are pinching uh, you are uh, definitely going to pinch the softer epoxy uh, coating which will lead to uh, damage especially near the uh, bend region I'll show you a picture on that so this is how it is you can see here and when you the, these are the damages which are caused due to the uh, pinching of the uh, liver arm and also when uh, if the epoxy doesn't have good elastic property at the time of this bending it will lead to cracks like this at the uh, bend region and these are bars which are just 90 degree bend and imagine if they are actually used for um, uh, stirrups uh, for earthquake resistant designs which would have to be bent uh, to 135 degrees so that's another problem we, we should not uh, bend these bars after epoxy coating the best practice is to bend it before epoxy coating okay uh, bend before epoxy coating and then um, uh, uh, then take it to the site now what will happen if there are damages like this scratches etc like this on the rebar what will happen is some of the scratches will tend to uh, corrode or will become anode like this here uh, the uh, scratches at the center is an anode and then the remaining scratches help or functions like a uh, cathode and they don't corrode so you can see very clearly here uh, some can become anode and the other help in corroding by becoming cathode and this is dangerous because then you will have localized corrosion happening which will not be the case if it is an uncoated rebar the the corrosion will happen more uniformly here the localized corrosion uh, the chances of localized corrosion is very high uh, and that is uh, something which we need to be worried about these are some pictures collected from uh, you know construction sites in a major city in india and you can see that these bars uh, you know they are exposed to sunlight this means uh, there might be construction delays uh, or there might be different stages of construction so during this whole process these bars gets exposed to sunlight for uh, weeks or months or even sometimes years depending on various you know construction delays so there is a possibility that the bars gets exposed to sunlight and what is the exposure to sunlight means is it's exposed to uv radiation so when it is ex i mean here is another example you can see this uh, again a lot of uh, scratches are there on this bar damages uh, and it is exposed to sunlight uh, I have seen this structure it is there uh, you know like this for several months it's uh, construction there is some significant delay so significant uh, exposure to UV radiation is uh, happening uh, which leads to cracking so we looked at some of the we did an experiment and then we found that when these are exposed to UV radiation cracks tend to form in about 15 days you can actually see that the cracks are forming in this so this is about uh, 0.3 micrometer uh, in crack width size and as time passes you can see that crack width is slowly slowly increasing you know uh, from here you can see the crack width is increasing and then day 34 and then 40 47 50, 
47, 54, all this as you go towards the uh, right, the crack width is increasing, means more and more volatile materials is being lost from the uh, epoxy coating. And once there are cracks, it's very easy for moisture, oxygen, chlorides, etc. to penetrate and lead to underfilling corrosion or uh, crevice corrosion. This, that's a major, uh, you know, problem. So this is another picture just to show you after exposure for about two months how the crack, very severe cracks. So the third picture, first picture shows without any cracking. Second picture very uh, shows the cracks. And if it is not really visible, look at the third picture which uh, really shows all the cracks which are on the second uh, micrograph. Okay, so this is a serious concern because most of our construction sites there will be delays and you really want to uh, have a steel uh, system which will not have any cracks on the coating until the uh, steel is covered with the uh, concrete. Otherwise, it's very uh, vulnerable to corrosion even without the presence of chlorides. That's the most important point to take uh, uh, here is that this uh, corrosion can lead to, sorry, uh, the uh, cracks can lead to corrosion even when there is no uh, chlorides at the steel surface. That means uh, very short span uh, of uh, service life or the corrosion free service life is going to be very very small. So this is uh, that uh, mechanism, this picture on the bottom right uh, basically to show the mechanism. You can see here one crack right here, one crack is there and then if uh, chlorides, moisture, all that is penetrating through this Oxy, uh, oxy, oxygen, uh, chlorides, moisture, all that can penetrate through this uh, crack in the epoxy coating. This is the concrete region, this is the green portion is the epoxy coating and this is the steel region. Okay. Now, the, once it reaches, once the moisture and oxygen reaches or goes through the crack and reaches the steel surface, it will then move to the right and left and then you will have an anode formation uh, and a cathode formation right inside in that region. I mean, uh, wherever there is an oxygen depleted region, that region will become an anode. And if it is, uh, you know, rich in, uh, relatively rich in oxygen, that region will become a uh, cathode. So this will definitely lead to significant underfilling corrosion in short period of time. And Another laboratory study, the study which showed that a significant increase, if the coating is very good, we were able to, I mean, uh, the coating is very good, the corrosion uh, was uh, observed only after about 100 days, when the coating was exposed to UV radiation, the corrosion was observed in about just 10 days. Sorry, um, just 50 plus days. Okay, so there is a significant reduction in the time taken to uh, corrode the steel, uh, steel rebar. So very, uh, we have multiple uh, evidences are there to say that this uh, UV exposure or exposure to sunlight can really lead to significant uh, corrosion or early corrosion of the epoxy coated rebar even when there is no. Uh, chlorides presence go for uh, uncoated uh, rebars which will give you almost similar uh, performance with a very similar uh, service life okay so this is just a summary of uh, these two if there is scratching this is the proposed mechanism if there is a uv exposure this is the mechanism scratch damage this is what is going to happen and uv damage this is what is going to happen okay we already looked at it the formation of anode and cathode cells, uh, anodic and cathodic sites uh, and under the film uh, corrosion or crevice corrosion, this is uh, going to really lead to localized corrosion which are hard to identify or detect and at the same time can lead to significant section loss locally. This is some pictures showing uh, on a real bridge, on a real bridge how uh, this is I think about five years old bridge even without any chloride, these rebars were corroding. So I am reinstating that it is more dangerous to use damaged epoxy coated steel rebars than, un than conventional uncoated uh, steel rebars. And I, this is some picture showing how ideally this should be done. You know, this, these rebars should not be bent at site at all 
and even the ends should be epoxy coated this is uh, you know what the practice is abroad if even if they are going for epoxy coating uh, the uh, the, epo the bending and all those uh, mechanical processes are done before the epoxy coating is done uh, bending and cutting everything is done before epoxy coating that's how we should also practice if we are actually going for it and if uh, for the tie wires also we should not use uh, you know uncoated or metallic tie wires we should go for uh, a plastic coated tie wires which or in other words a material which is uh, of similar hardness or softness as the epoxy coating should be used and uh, if we are, are using needle vibrators we should use uh, not the metallic needle vibrators, but the mid needle. The vibrator should have a sleeve which is uh, made of a soft material like rubber. As you see in the picture here, these are rubber coated uh, needle vibrators, so that these type of scratches are not induced on the rebars because of the vibration process. In normal construction, we don't see this because this process is happening after the concrete is placed. So that is the challenge here, and then. Also, the couplers which we use, metallic couplers, as you uh, tighten these couplers or you know fasten them onto the rebars, what you are actually doing is you are uh, you know uh, pinching onto the uh, epoxy coating or really damaging the epoxy coating. Another type of uh, non-metallically coated rebar which is uh, widely used in the construction is uh, this uh, cement polymer composite. Uh, or CPC uh, coated rebars. Let's look at what is this rebar. Can you have three uh, you know major processes at first stage you have to uh, clean the rebar surface uh, it, the recommendation is clean it by uh, sandblasting which is sometimes very difficult to practice at most of the construction sites so you have to really get a very clean uh, steel surface and then you apply a primer coat on that steel surface which is this number item number two here and then on top you apply a seal coat which is item number three here so this is how uh, uh, this is made and what is primer coat it's essentially a cement uh, with uh, acrylic acrylic polymers as additive uh, i'm sorry it's the reverse it's acrylic polymer with cement as additive so the, the, you should read this uh, acrylic, acrylic polymer with cement as additive and seal coat also acrylic polymer with uh, cement as additive. The cement is the additive here, not the polymer. So just please correct that. Um, and they are available in different uh, color. And main idea is they help in, yeah, the uh, protection mechanism is this type of coating provides an alkaline environment. Because of the presence of the steel in this coating, it provides an alkaline environment to the steel which helps in pro providing a, or you know forming a good passive filling which is not the case in uh, the fiber uh, uh, in the uh, fusion bonded epoxy coated rebar where there is no alkalinity provided on the steel surface uh, it is uh, just a physical barrier uh, it is dependent on but in this case of cpc coated rebar physical barrier plus this alkaline environment uh, uh, you know helps in corrosion protection and also this coating eliminate direct physical contact between the metal and the uh, concrete or the steel and the concrete and also you get a reduction in the oxygen supply so similar uh, mechanisms but uh, one ad added feature is that this alkaline uh, environment uh, is available in case of cpc coated rebars now that's the, what I just discussed is the best practice and if you have a good coating it will have long life but if you have considering the way it is being done at the many construction sites we are seeing a lot of challenges or trouble uh, or concerns uh, with the use of this type of um, coating. This picture was taken from a coastal bridge construction. You can see the piers, uh, you know the gauge for the pier of this particular bridge and what you see here is the top portion of this it's it's not at all coated and only the bottom portion is coated here and that too was coated after the cage is made when you are making something which is after the cage is made uh, you know getting the entire steel surface coated is very difficult so ideally we should coat the steel surface and then make the cage but this in this particular case it is done the other way opposite 
So what is the end effect is something like this as you see on the close-up picture on the right you can see that some region is white in color and some region is uh, rust color the brown color. So definitely there is a non-uniform or you know uneven or you know even uh, discontinuous coating on the uh, that that is a challenge when you have this discontinuous unevenness or you know non-uniform thickness etc you are actually inviting trouble by creating a corrosion cells or you know art, you, you are inducing corrosion or making the uh, you are increasing the chance of corrosion uh, in such cases either you apply a good coating or don't apply coating that's the message to be taken now to study this or quantify the effect of this uh, you know improper coating we did some study and uh, we found that this is how we studied we prepared specimens like this uh, small uh, you know prism specimens with three rebars one two and three you can see the cross section here how the specimen looks like and then we pondered the specimen for with chloride solution for long period and we found that you know the uh, as you see on the uh, first image first photograph ar uh, which is actually a uh, well coated uh, you know well coated but uh, with uh, some rust on the steel surface that is what as received means as received with some rust on the steel surface we apply the coating which is the practice being done or adopted at the construction sites but the right practice is with uh, you know sandblasting and then apply the coating so we tried these two uh, cases how they are performing or how the corrosion resistance is getting affected you see on the left picture this this sketch on the left side you can see the lot of region is uh, either corroded or peeled off okay this uh, light gray is like peeled off region and the black is the corroded region corroded and this, this is peeled off region significant corrosion has been observed in the case of uh, as received rebars so this is a r case and this is s b case on the right side you can see that on the right side s b case the amount of corrosion is much less so definitely steel surface preparation is very very important and um, uh, we if we are adopting cpc coated technology we must ensure that the coating is applied on a clean sandblasted surface otherwise it's going to be um, uh, harmful to the structure so we looked at microstructure of uh, you know micro these are two micrographs but the one on the left side shows how the coating is adhered to the steel surface you can see steel here and this is the coating and then there is a nice crack which is all along the uh, interface between the coating as you can see there is a micro crack which is absent in this case uh, where in the case on the right side so you can see steel here, steel and then well adhered CPC coating and there is no crack on uh, between the uh, or there is no crack at the interface between the steel and the uh, mortar. So definitely this surface preparation plays a significant role. How it affects the service life? If the, prop, the uh, uh, coating application is not really good, how the service life gets affected? So again, uh, as I discussed earlier, the chloride threshold for uncoated steel, we can assume it to be about 0.4 or this is what we determined. And with uh, WC here, this WOC is without coating, WC is with coating, again here the without coating and with coating. And the left two is as received case and this is sandblasted case. Definitely there is an advantage of sandblasting in increasing the chloride threshold. As if you compare this, the first two, if you compare the first two like these two, in the case of as received case, you can see that, you can see that the as received case, there is no significant increase in the chloride threshold. It's only from 0 0.4 to 0 0.5. But if you actually sandblast and provide this coating, you get the chloride threshold increases from 0.4 to about 0.8 plus, almost double. So that really tells you that the life can be enhanced if the coating is applied with proper sandblasting. 
So the message is the coating technology is good provided the steel surface is very well cleaned at the time of uh, application of coating and uh, what is the impact in terms of uh, service life is that if uh, you know if the uh, well coat if the coating is applied on a sandblasted surface you might get an average service life of uh, uh, 100 plus years 120 25 years just for a special uh, specific case you know case one we can let's say case study this is a case study okay but if you actually have uh, co applied coating without sandblasting it's almost s about 70 years so that's not really uh, it very clearly says that this application of this coating if it is done without uh, proper cleaning it doesn't really do any uh, good job it's just uh, mere waste of uh, you know money another type of rebar which is uh, used is the uh, in the construction market today it's uh, more and more of this type of bars are available in india it's gets slowly getting into the market uh, it's fiber reinforced polymer rebars or non metallic uh, rebars typically glass fibers are all used and basalt fibers are also used these are the two major type of fibers which are used for uh, this type of bars uh, and why it is being used it's very light compared to uh, steel rebars and it can be manufactured in whichever shape length and shape that's also possible so what is this uh, frp uh, rebar is you have fibers like this and this is the polymer matrix or epoxy and then at the end you get a product like this so all these fibers are held together or glued together with an epoxy uh, resin. These are just the pictures on the right side show some of these uh, uh, fibers which are available in the market. That bottom picture clearly shows you can also get this type of rebars which are already bent. Definitely you cannot bend these. These are very brittle materials. So you cannot bend these at the uh, construction site. You have to do it early enough. Advantage are, uh, advantages are that there is a non-conductive uh, so, uh, you know, it can be very good for applications where power generation plants and other specialized installations where electric shortcut, short circuit is a, a significant concern uh, due to the planned operations or other due to the use of the facility. And they are very brittle. This is a uh, disadvantage of this thing. And this is a good thing. And then non-metallic, non -co not corrosive, uh, non-corroding -co uh, material. But again, you have to see what is the definition of corrosion. If you are talking or if you are defining corrosion as a metal loss, of course, that is not there. But if you are defining corrosion as a material loss, then you have to think about the chemical attack also. So, uh, so no metallic corrosion, but you, uh, may, you know, this chemical attack and how it influences the performance of the uh, bar in long run mainly the attack due to the highly alkaline environment in concrete and probably the moisture which is present uh, you know in the concrete how this uh, gfrp or you know this uh, frp rebars gfrp is glass fiber reinforced uh, polymer or even uh, basalt anything these kind of materials how they perform in the long run in presence of highly alkaline concrete and in presence of moisture must be uh, studied before we can uh, widely use these type of rebars. There are some technology already available like alkali resistant uh, fibers are used. Now this is a, a picture showing uh, a poor quality FRP rebar. Uh, you can see here the ad over here because this is this uh, poor inadequate manufacturing process or you know known the quenching process on a uh, in other words, the uh, epoxy was allowed to flow in the vertical direction like this and leading to small, you know, you see bubbles forming like this, not, you know, bubbles of epoxy is formed. So the, this is also not good. It's an indicator that there is a lot more epoxy in the rebar than what is actually required. Or in other words, it's not really uh, well compacted. Uh, the the structure you you don't need epoxy as a filler you need epoxy as a binder only or a glue not necessarily as a filler so adding too much epoxy and uh, inadequate uh, quen uh, quenching or setting process is not 
really uh, is something which need to be looked at. It should be uniform. These kind of bubbles should not. These are all indicators of poor quality. Okay. And again, here you can see there is a lot of uh, you know air void present in this. That's also something uh, not a good uh, thing to uh, have on these kind of rebars. And let's see how. What is the failure mode of this type of rebar? These are definitely very brittle. And you can see here on the picture, first picture, this one debonding and shear rupture in this one also you can see the fibers are getting debonded you know debonded like this here debonded and also there is a shear also there is a uh, shear rupture like this you can see here you can see here these are all these are the two types of failure observed on the first two um, you know pictures or the first two type of uh, FRP bars and here on the second picture, uh, third picture here you can see there is a shear failure and slight, uh, um, uh, slight you know debonding happened on the first specimen you can see but it may not be a major concern the major governing failure so you all these have to be considered and before we start using these rebars in a wide larger scale and uh, how the pH uh, affects the shear modulus. Definitely you can see in about in this picture on in the graph on the right side bar chart. So this is an unexposed relative to the unexposed bars. Most of the other bar charts are below uh, this or less than one. Relative shear modulus of elasticity is less than one indicating that there is a possibility of reduction in the uh, mechanical properties uh, of this type of bars when they get exposed to uh, lower pH uh, sorry get exposed to uh, uh, chemicals in other words concrete you know uh, even though there is no metallic corrosion but the other forms of degradation must be uh, tested or you know start investigated before we uh, go ahead and use this type of rebars and this is just a cost comparison uh, on how different type of uh, steel rebars which are coated uh, 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 what is the cost between the two the galvanized steel you can see it's about twice the cost FRP rebars it's about thrice the cost and the, the uh, CPC coated and if, uh, you know fusion bonded epoxy coated is about 1.2 to 1.4 so this is probably the reason why these two types of non-metallic coating coated rebars are used but we should be very careful uh, about going for life cycle cost. I mean, not don't look at only the capital cost, but also look at the life cycle cost and the durability. These two are very very important to look at before selecting steel reinforcement because the structure's life will depend not only on the concrete but also on the performance of the steel. That balanced uh, balance which we were talking earlier that is very very important. And so we covered how the galvanized steel rebars can exhibit higher chloride threshold and low corrosion rate and also uh, wider wider pH pH uh, passivation range so the, those are the advantages of uh, galvanized steel rebars FR, F, uh, fusion bonded epoxy coated rebar and CPC coated epoxy coated rebar, uh, CPC coated rebars both are good in terms of the uh, if, if they are you know manufactured in a proper way and implemented in a proper way they, are, they can give you long give long life but considering the uh, site practices and uh, uh, rough handling etc or even the inadequate preparation of the steel surface these rebars are not performing. Uh, the, we have enough evidence uh, showing that they will not really uh, last very long as compared to an uncoated uh, rebar uh, and then also we discussed about the uh, fiber reinforced polymer rebar definitely we should look at the even though uh, look at the longevity of those uh, rebars in highly alkaline environment like we see in concrete. They may not corrode there is no metallic corrosion but other form of chemical attack is possible so that should be taken into consideration these are the references uh, for further reading in this uh, material in, in this area reading in this uh, material in, in this area